Yay! Now it's starting. Um, <laughs> has anyone ever been like uh, in a presentation and like they're thrown up on by the presenter? <laughs> has that no? Okay, so this could be a really fun night for at least one of you. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep my distance, but uh, just FYI. Uh, my name is Kylie Shredley. I am a Rubyist. Uh, I am a back-end web developer. If you cannot tell, I don't know anything about design. Um, I work for a company here in Atlanta called Big Nerd Ranch. Um, I'm a back-end web developer there. I work as a consultant. We also do teaching. So if you, most of you, I assume, by being in this room, probably have an intimate knowledge of Ruby on Rails. But if you or some frustrating coworker you work with doesn't have an extremely intimate knowledge of Ruby on Rails and you wish that they did, I would recommend that they come to our one-week boot camp for developers. Um, that's a good thing to say. OK. <laughs> um, so I, before I get started, like Lance's talk, I do need like a little bit of context about you guys to know how much you know, uh, so I don't speak about something that doesn't make any sense. Um, how many people in this room uh, are currently or were ever children? Anyone? <laughs> okay, okay, so that's good there. A couple of you were children, not everyone, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> that's totally fine. Uh, of those of you who were at some point or are currently children, how many of you have heard of a character called Amelia Bedelia? Anybody? Oh, thank goodness, a couple people have heard of Amelia Bedelia. Well, um, I'm gonna introduce her to all of you anyways, just to make sure we all have the same experience before we get started, because this is a very dull talk if you don't know anything about Amelia Bedelia. Um, and that is actual feedback I have gotten already. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm gonna try to make sure you don't have that, um, that experience either. So Amelia is a children's book character, but I think that she is a very good archetype for kind of like a stereotypical developer. She is notoriously literal, and she's practical to a fault. Um, so you can see here, she's dressed as a maid, but she also has um, like some old-timey doctor's equipment. She's had like a lot of different jobs, um, but in this particular scenario, she's working as a domestic servant for this very wealthy couple called the Rogers. And they've given her like a to-do list of all the things that she needs to do that day. And on the list, um, it says to repair a chicken dinner. And Amelia Bedelia isn't quite sure what this means, but she tries her best. And so the best thing that Amelia can think of is a chicken dinner is a dinner of cracked corn. Because when she sees chickens and they're eating, they're always eating cracked corn. So a chicken dinner must be a dinner for chickens. Um, and she serves it up in dishes. And of course, the Rogers are furious because that is obviously not what they wanted. Um, to them, but it's not that obvious to Amelia because she tends to interpret things so literally. She is determined to complete work even when it doesn't make sense to her. Uh, you might even call her stubborn. So when she looks at the to-do list and another item on the list says to dust the furniture, she goes to the bathroom and this clearly dates the books, finds dusting powder, whatever that is. I guess people used to use that in the bathroom. Uh, she finds dusting powder and she just applies a fine coat of it to all of the furniture in the house. And even while she's doing it, she's thinking, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me because at my house we undust the furniture, but this is what was requested, so this is what I'll deliver. Um, does that sound familiar to anyone? You're requested to do something and it, it just doesn't quite feel right, but they seem to be very specific and explicit in the request, so you do exactly that. Yes, <laughs> all of us. It sounds like the wife of a <laughs> Yeah, okay, thank you, Lance. So in your heads, you should be thinking what Lance said out loud for you, if your heads are not working right. That kind of sounds like software developers working with customers. <laughs> this word you use, it means something to me that I don't think it means to you. <laughs> yeah, yes, that situation. That sometimes happens to some people in this room. Uh, Amelia always managed to turn things around though. Uh, no one can deny that she's a really hard worker and she's willing to learn as well as help others learn. Uh, in the case of the dusted furniture, her employers come home and they're furious as again with the chicken dinner prepared exactly to spe specifications. Um, and they explain to her, 
Amelia, obviously we wanted the dust removed from the furniture. We did not want you to apply dust to the furniture. And Amelia, in, um, uh, I don't know, not, maybe not a sarcastic tone, but maybe with some glibness, says, well, you asked me to dust it, so I'm not, I'm not really sure what you thought I was going to do. Uh, it, really, it really read like you wanted me to apply dust to it. Uh, but she helps her employer use more specific language, and specifically to indicate that if they want the furniture undusted, they should say that. So I think that throughout all of her faults, she is working really hard and she's trying to learn. She just doesn't know these things right away. So I think that kind of commitment to hard work and willingness to learn also makes Amelia a really good archetype for a developing developer, someone who is still learning how to code. Um, they're, exceed, they're, they're eager and they're excited to learn, but on their own, they're making mistakes and they, to they don't totally understand it and they don't totally understand why. Uh. Uh, Amelia Bedelia isn't real, though. Uh, these are books for very small children. What? Secret. Ignore that one. Forget it. Um, so these books are for very small children, so they don't really have a lot in the way of plot. But at the end of every book, Amelia saves the day because she's just such a hard worker. You can't, you can't help but like her and root for her, because even though she's getting everything wrong consistently, she works really hard, and at the end of the day, she makes one of her famous desserts. Uh, which is oftentimes a date cake, and when she can't find any dates, she, in Amelia Bedelia fashion, she finds a calendar and cuts the dates out and mixes them in the cake, because that will probably taste good and not be poisonous. Um, but unfortunately, these stories end with this kind of cathartic moment where Amelia is redeemed, and we don't talk about the mistakes anymore, and I think that a lot of us when we were learning to code, and I've made this mistake myself, frame our struggle the same way. I worked hard and I made so many mistakes and I screwed up all the time, but then this happened and everything got better and now I get it and now I feel better. Um, but that's not realistic, that's not what happens. We have these ups and downs every day. It's much more like this all the time. There is no climax, there's no denouement to being a developer where you reach this high point and just stay up there in the clouds forever. Or, I mean, if it does come to that, it has not yet been revealed to me. <laughs> um, so it's these constant peaks and valleys. Uh, some days you're doing awesome, and then other days you're Amelia Bedelia. You're literally interpreting some request and delivering something horrible that no one ever would ever want. Um, or you're just making extremely silly mistakes. Uh, most recently for me, I thought that I had gotten clever and I discovered a, uh, a what, as you call them in Ruby. If, if you've seen Gary Bernhardt's Destroy All Software talks, he talks about these what's, which are like, what is wrong? Why is it doing this? Like just a really strange software behavior. And I thought that I had gotten smart and I was smarter than Matt's and I found a what in Ruby. And that was, I tried to, um, I tried to infer equality on time.now and another instance of time.now. And I was like, they don't match. What's up? You can't explain that. And I, I told everyone I worked with <laughs> that I found that. And they were like, yeah, uh, because they are instantiated at different times. <laughs> what? <laughs> and that is, that is basically every day at work for me. <laughs> So some people have more peaks in between the valleys, but generally speaking, being a software developer is a lot of peaks and valleys. Um, but when you're a beginner, you don't know that everyone else is going through that. You feel like you're the only one making these mistakes and you are the first and last de developer to do this and maybe you're just not smart enough to do it or something like that. So we want to think about the mistakes that we make and talk about them with beginners so that they know that they're not alone. Um, okay, I'm gonna level with everyone here now. Uh, it seems like maybe everyone's getting like a little drowsy because the, the talk before was very good but now it's kind of later so maybe everyone's getting like a little sleepy and that's fine, it's totally okay because it's 8.30 which is when I try to go to bed too, uh, so I get that. What if, um, what if instead of finishing the talk, I've read you guys my favorite stories? Oh my god, yes! Sure, yes. <laughs> that sounds amazing! 
Oh, thank you. Yes. OK, I will read it to you specifically. All right. Um, coincidentally, the story is actually called Amelia Bedelia Learns to Code. Um, and it is also coincidentally written by me. <laughs> I'm very good at everything. Uh, illustrated by San Kelly, and it's inspired by the works of Peggy and Herman Parrish, who wrote the original Amelia Bedelia stories. Amelia Bedelia is speaking with her employers, the Rogers family. It's time for her annual review. Mr. Rogers says, Amelia, you've always done good work once we manage to get on the same page. We definitely appreciate your unique approaches to problem solving, but you're so literal, it drives me insane. It's like talking to a robot or or a computer. Talking to a computer, Amelia thinks to herself, now that sounds like fun. Hey, where are you going? Don't you want to know what your raise will be? Shouts Mr. Rogers. Amelia doesn't hear him. All she can think about is how much fun it will be to talk to computers. Amelia reads that to talk to a computer, you have to speak their language. But it looks like there are quite a few languages you can use to talk to them. Amelia's new friends mentioned she might enjoy a language called Ruby. Amelia thinks that sounds nice, but why Ruby specifically? Why Ruby? Why not Ruby? <laughs> Shout two strange foxes who have mysteriously appeared. <laughs> <laughs> Ruby has elegant syntax. It's natural to read and easy to write, they follow up. If you like Ruby, you'll love Ruby on Rails. It's a web framework that's optimized for developer enjoyment. Rails lets you write beautiful code. Yeah, what he said. An easy way to talk to the computer that's designed with developer happiness in mind? If being a developer is what it takes to talk to computers, I certainly want to be happy while I do it. Ruby it is, says Amelia, to no one in particular, as the strange foxes has, have already disappeared in the same mysterious way they arrived. There's the foxes. <laughs> this Ruby on Rails stuff is easy, Amelia thinks. It's got HTML and CSS. I know how to use those. There's a database. I've worked with databases before, too. No problem. Amelia is working her way through a beginner Rails project when she realizes she needs to add a table to her database. Looks like the schema file is a central resource for the state of the database. So what does Amelia do? You guys can join in on that part. What, what does Amelia do? Almost exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> she edits the schema file, of course. Now she has another table in her database without involving those strange, randomly numbered migrations. Oh no, Amelia! I can't read this at all! exclaims Amelia's computer. In some languages or frameworks, you can edit the database schema directly to make changes to the database, but in Rails, the schema is just a representation of state. The migrations seem to be randomly numbered, but those numbers at the beginning of the file are actually the date time that the migration was created. Amelia nods and her computer continues. Since we've only built a really basic database, it does seem like the migrations represent individual tables, but they really represent the changes that are going to be made to the database. I use the migrations to make the database for you and put the date time of the last one migration at the top of the schema to let you know that migration and all of the previous migrations are included. What a silly mistake. I won't do something like that again. I'll remember to write migrations when I want to update the database, and I'll always remember to run them using rake so that they'll update my schema file. Amelia is having a lot of fun at her first hackathon. The team she is working with is requesting a ton of features, many of them directed to all different routes. Amelia's teammates are excited, but getting antsy for the new web views for their app. So what does Amelia do? That's exactly it, OK. <laughs> she activates each of the routes by raking them all before committing and pushing her code. Can you guys see the little routes in there? We have the edit, <laughs> index. <laughs> With each new route, she writes a new HTML file, adds the route to the route RB file, and rakes the route. Rake is short for Ruby, shorthand for Ruby make. So I rake each new route so it will be available in my web views. I'm not going to make the same mistake I made with my migrations and forget to rake my routes, expecting them to be there anyways. Oh no, Amelia, you don't have to rake the routes to activate them for your application. Rake just shows you a preview of what the routes will look like in a URL. Why not, asks Amelia. I have to rake the migrations. It makes sense I need to rake the routes, too. Amelia's computer explains, it is a little confusing that rake creates your database migrations, but you don't need it to create routes. The routes are created when you add them to the route RB. There's no harm in raking the routes, but it's not needed either. 
Oh, okay, I think I'm getting it a little bit now. I can't believe I spent so much time raking each new route I added. My teammates are gonna be excited to see all the new routes much sooner. Amelia is writing an application with her out-of-town friends, Fred and Carrie. Fred and Carrie have been developers for a while and are always hip to the latest trends and Ruby gems. Fred and Carrie say gems are great. They're just libraries of code. Why write it yourself when you can put a gem in it? You can find a gem for everything. It's like you never have to write code yourself. Amelia thinks, what could go wrong? <laughs> Seems like a good idea. <laughs> Amelia thinks these gems are pretty handy. It seems like I can just drop them in wherever and have access to a ton of code written by someone else. Yes. <laughs> Amelia adds her favorite gem to each new project she starts. I'll save myself some time and some code. You know what this gem is missing, says Carrie. You know, oh gosh. You know what this app is missing, says Carrie. Gems. Let's spruce it up. Make it pretty with the Draper gem. What a sad little application. I know, I'll put the Rails admin gem on it. <laughs> that's, that's just hard to say. Did you see this app before? I didn't. These are her friends from out of town. What town are they from? Maybe, it doesn't, <laughs> it, due to copyright infringement, it does not say. Yeah. Not so fast, says Amelia's computer. Gems can be very useful, but they are not the answer to every problem. Every gem you add to the gem file might have dependencies on other gems, and those might have dependencies on other gems, too. You could be adding a lot of complexity and not even realize it. Okay, I got it. I'll be sure that I only actually need a gem before I add it to my gem file. Amelia is working on another new application, this time independent of tutorials and guides. She's not exactly sure what all this application needs, but she knows she can cover most things using the Rails generator to scaffold new models, views, and controllers quickly. She uses the scaffold, of course, for everything. I'll just use the Rails generator to create a new model. That's just as easy as writing the files by hand myself. In fact, it's even easier. You can see that she needs a doghouse, but she's using the scaffold, so she's got maybe a little bit more. Amelia, do we really need all of this? Says Amelia's computer. The rail scaffold is handy, but you don't have to use it to create everything. You can use the generator to just generate a model, view, or controller. You can even just create new files without using the generator. And Rails convention over configuration design will make sure things match up how they should. But it's so much easier this way, says Amelia. Easier for you, maybe, replies Amelia's computer. I still have to load all of the assets created by the scaffold, and we might not even need all of them. Okay, I see. I'll remember that for next time. I'm sorry, I swiped too far. All right, okay, now we're ready. But that was good, so we're ready for the next one. Okay, so I don't need to use the Rails generator to make everything. I can just create the files myself. Amelia remembers what the Fox has told her, that Rails is designed with convention over configuration. I want to write the best code that I can. I'll follow the framework's convention and write good code the Rails way. I wasn't even on it. You're now it's all wrong. We're going to start from the beginning. <laughs> when she creates new controllers, she follows the same format as the controllers created by the Rails scaffold. If this is how DHH would do it, this is how I'll do it, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Amelia, exclaims Amelia's computer. Convention over configuration doesn't mean that you have to use Rails only with the framework's con conventions. It just means you don't have to configure connections between conventionally named models, controllers, and views. When you include all that code, you can also accidentally include different features. For instance, leaving the two respond with blocks in the controller could allow you to inadvertently expose a JSON endpoint for that controller. Ah, so that's what that means. Convention over configuration just helps configure the, the con connections for conventionally named objects. You got it, Amelia. Amelia is working as an intern at a software development company. The client she works with, Corporate Business Inc., requests some new parameters to be added to an existing model. So what, does what does Amelia do? She does exactly what they asked for and adds the new column directly to the params hash. 
They'll be so excited. So you can see she's making a hash from potatoes. <laughs> well, that's a really good joke, so you don't have to make <laughs> noise. Oh, sorry. Whoops, a client can say parameters, which seems like a general term, but that word has more meaning in a Rails project. Turns out what the client really needs is just a new table column to save records to. No problem, though, because Amelia's workplace has, a, has code reviews, so the mistake is caught and corrected before being deployed. This is a great opportunity for Amelia to learn to push back on client requests, and for a semi-technical client to learn a little bit about Rails architecture. Great work, Amelia. Amelia is coaching at her first Rails workshop. She finally knows enough to feel comfortable coaching and helping others learn to code. She overhears a group talking about scheduling tasks for an add-on to the workshop's base project. They want to use a time field for this, but everything falls apart when they try to schedule dates very, very, very far in the future. Amelia's worked with future dates before and has and made this very same mistake before, too. So what does it do? Perfect. She heads over and explains. Hey, I've had that problem too. It's an easy mistake to make, but if you use date time instead of date or instead of time, you won't have that problem. That's why I always use date time whenever I need dates. This is a good joke if you read a lot of the Amelia Video books. So you can laugh at it anyways. It's a date cake. Yes. Okay. Good. Free ticket to RailsConf. I don't know how, but I'll, someone else will buy it for you. One of these people can laugh. That's not even the silliest mistake I've made yet. I'm still making mistakes every day, and that's okay, because, I'm making, because making mistakes means that I'm learning. Even if it feels like I'm learning things the hard way, I know a lot more about why things work the way they do. Plus, sometimes my mistakes help someone else learn, too. When we talk about why it happened, I can help them learn better. Maybe they try to edit, edit this database schema because they have worked with Access, and I can help them by pointing out the analogous parts of an active, of active record in a Rails application. Because I keep making mistakes every day, I know that part of learning software development and getting good at it me means making a lot of mistakes. And that's OK with me. Yay. So that's yeah. it. <laughs> All right, that can, that can be the end. Um, OK, so this talk, uh, like Lance's talk, was in preparation for RailsConf. And it will be on. Um, the beginner track, but I'm really glad that I was able to give it to all of you because I think the, the biggest takeaway here is that it's important and it's good and it's healthy to talk about our mistakes. Um, if any of you can think back to the time when you were first starting to learn how to code and someone that you really respected who you thought was a super genius made a mistake in front of you and we're like, oh, I can't believe I keep doing that. I always do that. It just makes the entire process it hum I guess it humanizes the entire process. And like they seem like a human to you. And you're thinking, me, also as a human, I can do this. Like if, if the other people who I think are geniuses make mistakes, then it's OK if I make mistakes too. And when I was researching for this talk and writing it, I spoke with a lot of the beginners that I have gotten to know recently. And a lot of us make the same mistakes. So in all likelihood, we probably made a lot of the same mistakes. I would assume. No one was born like knowing Rails, except DHH, and he's not here. <laughs> so I would assume that most of us in this room made very similar mistakes in the past. So um, if you have time to remember to take something away from this talk, uh, I would encourage you to talk about the mistakes that you make, especially like the really silly, funny ones, with junior developers that you know or work with. Does anybody want to talk about mistakes right now? What? Everyone? That guy? Definitely. I killed my Salesforce instance today by accident. What did uh, you do? Production. It was, a, it was a DevOps mistake. Yeah. It happens. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it was not fun. That is my mistake for the day. I called sudo reboot on a uh, really important web server before I realized, oh, that wasn't the sandbox. <laughs> yeah. I put an insecure instance of a auth out, or doorkeeper, rather, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> I deleted a gem file that locked the first day. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. I did that one, too. I also edited the scheme file. 
Yep. I knew other people did that. I was like, I'm going to put it in the talk and someone's going to admit to it. Yep. Blue Wave Production Database. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're done. Yeah, done it. I uploaded an empty directory over a WordPress directory. <laughs> using <an empty> <laughs> nice. Yes, you did. It was the only <laughs> copy of the WordPress site. <laughs> so you really tested their backup strategy. They didn't, well, so half my fault. They didn't use version control, and we all used FTP, kind of like fighting over the one FTP server. Oh, Come on, this, this was like 2009. Give me a break. Okay. <laughs> so I uploaded my latest copy over someone else's, and I mean, the I don't. Was gone. If you're up, if you're uploading over an FTP server like that, it sounds like it could have been anyone's fault. <laughs> could they could they really track it down to you? It could have been anyone. Was the password password? <laughs> it might as well have been. There maybe one or two over there. I was trying to parse uh, comments um, and got uh, too many hashtag errors. <laughs> but, um, I guess, yeah, that was, I was actually trying to write like a header file um, in Ruby and um, it just controls uh, some Arduino boards um, and OLEDs. But, um, and I guess it's working. <laughs> so. Yeah, that sounds right. I guess it's working. <laughs> a little esoteric, but we, we're troubleshooting um, some iOS code today. And we're trying to work with OpenSSL. And, and you know, when you're trying to work with OpenSSL, you like create the key and you create some other things, and then you free them later before you exit the function. And we've got our breakpoint there, and we're looking at our code, and we're going, why does this key not have any values? Why can we not get this? And half an hour later, we realized that because your breakpoint is after the point at which you freed the key. <laughs> so. Classic mistake. You could have double freed it. Other than yeah. you might have warped the space-time continuum inside the app. Thanks, yeah, so thanks for not messing up space and time. <laughs> I typed Google into Google and broke the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I wrote a proxy service that was supposed to cache an API, and uh, it was never caching anything. It wasn't running anything to the cache <laughs> for about a month, so. <laughs> Did you, uh, and then the, you intern, any performance? then the intern blew it up, actually. <laughs> that did happen. I was, <clears throat> I was trying to reload um, the model, so it pulled the data from the database, and I was just typing reload in the console instead of model.reload, and it was just reloading the code. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did something similar to that, too. I took a functional programming class recently, and it's pretty cool, but I mixed up like some of the terminology um, that I used, so like to reload like the kind of like the console for that language, you write reload, but you write it like you might a Ruby symbol with uh, a colon in the front. And so like then I started getting back into Ruby and I kept doing, trying to reload IRB with just just writing the symbol reload. And I was like, no, where is everything? Why is IRB always broken now ever since I installed GHC on my computer? <laughs> and that's when I realized I was typing completely the wrong thing. And I yelled at my computer in public. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. We could be done. I think you should have monads in that just for fun. Ooh. Yeah, a lot of beginner Rubyists run into monads, yeah. so that would be <laughs> extremely <laughs> topical. What are you saying, man? That doesn't make any sense. I'm totally trolling. <laughs> So I think it's really, I, I like your talk, I think it's really important like gaining empathy from a like more senior perspective down to a junior perspective, but are there any, I, I mean, there's so many like Rails resources, but is there anything that's just like, like here's the mistakes you're gonna make and like how to like not, like just like like proactively being like, oh yeah, that's, I, I don't know if that's, that exists or not, it sounds like it'd be cool, but. Um, negative data, it's like you don't publish that stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. So I don't know, it's just, uh, uh, maybe that exists, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. I don't, I, I looked for like a lot of things, like resources, and then like hopefully I would like find someone who knew everything and I would talk to them and they would like give me all the information and I would just do the talk. Uh, but that didn't happen, I didn't find that person. Maybe they're not, they don't exist or they don't have a website because uh, they're still making the mistakes so they can't get their <laughs> website online. Um, I haven't seen like a central repository of, of all that information. Uh, if you, 
If you want to know what a bunch of that stuff is, just start volunteering with beginners. And like all the time, you'll see that horrible, like I call it the red screen of death that you get in Rails when you don't run your migrations and it like you try to start the server and it doesn't load anything. And they're like, oh, I don't know what I did. And like, they're like, it didn't do this earlier, I promise. And you're like, no, it's okay. <laughs> we can fix this. Um, I don't know. I think you like start to see the patterns if you work with beginners. Obviously, when I was a beginner, I didn't realize other people were making these mistakes because I was freaking out too much about the mistakes I was making. So it was like hard to be super introspective. So just volunteer in your community. What? It'd be nice to like be able to point beginners to uh, like yeah. a place to go where they can see whatever. It's yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know what the use case would be, but I was just thinking like uh, you know it'd be convenient. You could be like you know let's like because you can if it's like especially if you're a beginner that doesn't have like like a mentor to go to that's like more experienced, you could burn hours on something that's like incredibly yeah. small. <laughs> it'd be nice if you could just be like, here's this thing. Because a lot of this stuff is exactly the same stuff. Like the point of your talk is sort of like, everyone's doing the same mistakes and like again and again, like having that empathy or just like their new mistakes. But you know, a lot of people are making the same mistakes and I think that if enough, if enough beginners were like, hey, I'm getting this red screen, this is what I did to get it. And then it's like, here's how I, here's like how I fixed it and like, I'm sure a lot of the, the trends come out of that and be like, oh, these are the things that people are doing often. And like, they can go to this resource so and just like that. look it up and have an answer. Or like, yeah, I guess the I think, stack overflows. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, I think part of the problem is like, you can read that there's, a, there's something that's going to trip you up. And you're like, OK, like I, I kind of like mentally assent to that. But then it's different than like wrestling with it and it like staring you in the face. And you learn it in like a more uh, tangible kind of way, I think. Perfect. I don't know if anyone. Yeah. You know, I think part of the journey for a new programmer is also learning how to problem solve better. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. It's, so it, it's not, it, programming in general is not the, you know, it's not like there's a destination. It's really a journey in general, whether you're a beginner or advanced. And I think part of that is that when you're a beginner, when, you, when you've been programming a bit longer, you've had experience on how to, where to look just in general with the new technology. So it's one thing where you're learning your first programming language, you have no idea whatsoever, versus you're learning your third or your fourth or something else like that. And so part of that is that journey. So it's like, if you give everybody just the answers to start off with, it's not helping them to learn that problem solving at the same time too. There are resources out there where people do share that, don't get me wrong with it, but the point being that it's, it's learning, okay, oh, you've got the re red screen of death, so then walking somebody through to say, Okay, so let's read what the error message is saying and let's try to, you know, that type of a thing with it. But when you've never looked at it before, you're like, this is Greek to me, all right, I need to, that type of thing is what it is. Yeah. It, yeah. I think Al is one of these that's Sorry, I won't have it like <laughs> So one of the mistakes that I remember and I, I think motivated me to do some of the newbie jams was doing sudo on RVM <laughs> instead of putting it locally. And then, <laughs> having multiple versions when I was doing like Emerald City. Yeah. And so I think that's, that helped me, you know, motivate me to help other people install. Because that, I don't think installing is a newbie level activity for someone brand new. Yeah, if they've never, you mean somebody who's brand new to programming versus somebody who's... No, just, I mean, just the Rails. I mean, when I walk someone through the installation process, mm -hmm. most of the time we're using a tutorial, but it's the where you get off track by doing something like you were talking about, doing something, oh, it doesn't matter if you do a pseudo or not with <laughs> RVM. Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> and you better know what you're doing if you're using pseudo. But, um, and so, and there are a lot of those kinds of things because there are a lot of steps to installing, you know, all the pieces as a, as a, because I remember spending days installing stuff at the beginning where now we can, you know, spend an afternoon or just a couple hours and stuff, so. Getting to Rails new is definitely probably 25% of the struggle in an entire boot camp that I've taught. It's just making sure that they can reliably open a terminal and get to where they can start their project again. Like mm -hmm. that trips everyone up. Yep. Interesting. Um, just just one comment on on Amelia Bedelia. Um, <clears throat> so Amelia Bedelia has a problem that I think that 
almost every junior developer I've ever worked with has, which is that they don't ask questions. They never come up to you and say, like, I don't understand how this works. I don't understand how to install this. I don't know any, you know, I, they, they never do, or they, they frequently don't. They, they want to solve everything themselves. They want to show that they have problem solving skills. And it's, yeah. Yeah. Like, unknown, unknown. Yeah. Like, I, I think going wrong. They do, but even, even when they're struggling or even when they say, like, well, this doesn't make sense. We mean, you know, the, the, take the dust of furniture thing. Dust of furniture, that doesn't make any sense. You know, this is a good time to, like, walk over to your team lead and go, okay, <laughs> this is what I think this instruction means. <laughs> Am I correct? And it's, you know, it's so much easier to to solve those kinds of problems or to, or to know that you have, they don't know what they don't know, but a question tells you, because you do know what they don't know, it tells you what they don't know, and then you can sit down and tell them what they need to know. <laughs> um. like, it's always really frustrating to learn about these things as soon as a like, problem comes up or have to learn about them when you hit the problem. And I know, like, I know as a beginner, it's really tough to like, dig in and figure out exactly why things work. But a lot of the time you kind of have to like, okay, that worked. I have no idea why. And then like actually take the time to go back and learn about it after the fact. I don't know. And there's, there's not really any, no one really teaches you how to do that. So it's crazy. I had a couple of questions. I'm completely new to coding. Like I don't know most of what was presented today. So I wanted to ask, if I was trying to build websites and apps just in general, uh, nothing too niche or anything, just in general, um, should I learn Ruby first or Ruby on Rails first? And should I also learn JavaScript or Java at the same time? Or what, uh, what route should I go first? What's the most efficient way to go the fastest with progress? And also, with the installing, what's the best website or tutorial or just guide that I can find online to help me do that uh, so that I do not screw it up and like crash my computer or some other mistake that I could make? Uh, all right, so that's like 100 questions. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what I don't know. Let's, yeah, uh, let's start our way at the end and like dig backwards. Rails is pretty containerized, so you probably won't crash your computer. Uh, do you have like a Windows machine or a Mac or Windows Linux? 7? Oh, excellent. You can use this thing called Rails Installer. Go to railsinstaller.org. Then once you figure out how to use Ruby on Rails, you will become dissatisfied with Rails Installer and you'll want to learn about version managers and you'll want to install a version manager and fight that battle when you get to it. Not today. <laughs> um, <laughs> it sounds like you want to write websites and web applications. Uh, you can actually make web applications in Ruby without using Rails, because there's like some other cool frameworks, or you could write your own. That's how Rails got made. Um, but Rails is pretty easy. I'd recommend learning Ruby and then learning Ruby on Rails. That was my personal preference. That worked better for me. Um, then you don't get confused about what kind of functions you're using that are, are these Ruby methods or are they Rails methods? Mm -hmm. What uh, JavaScript and Java? I would say use neither of those because I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> and you're asking me as the expert beginner, and I would say they're both garbage languages. Thank you. You, you probably be. saved me many months Cancel of struggling. Cancel <laughs> I haven't bought it yet. More approachable as a beginner. It also is, as a community, is more beginner friendly. Whether that's your, your language of choice as a beginner, that's a personal question. I mean, obviously, though, there's a biased answer here, but um, <laughs> with that, but that's what I would probably say with it. I mean, yeah, it's, it seems to be the best one for what I want to do. I just was curious because I saw a lot of like videos online and they said you should learn several different computer languages. And I don't know if that's really necessary. You should. You should learn them one at a time. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> True. You've got you to walk before you run. Okay. And doing multiple languages just as a matter of fact. But mm -hmm. to begin with, just have Find what's interesting, whether you end up liking Ruby and Rails the most, or you might actually enjoy doing JavaScript and front-end development more than you like Ruby. So oh, okay. just you know, try it out and see what you like, and then focus on something until you feel like you're able to create things. 
So, but don't start with JavaScript. So, so, <laughs> Much did Rails new and then started learning Ruby. Um, and something that was really attractive to me is that I was able to get a website up and get things that people could look at going, and I felt like that was really motivating to me. So like that drove me to okay, well now I have this. How do I get another page and how do I get it to do something cool? And now I get to integrate with some other like system so I can get Twitter on there or something. Uh, and so I felt like, you know, I don't know, it's 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 kind of motivating to be able to have a website and be doing things. So I don't know, like just jumping into it I think is really exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think I think so too. I want to try to learn as much as quickly as I can and to just build things just from the beginning, if possible. I don't know if that's possible, but just, yeah. Oh, another good uh, tutorial that I used to learn Rails is uh, railstutorial.org. Uh, they have like a whole guide of, you go through like building an application with them step by step. I think there's even like a whole chapter on installing it. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'd still recommend learning Ruby as well, alongside yeah. or beforehand. Yeah. And the Ruby Cones is uh, one thing I highly recommend. Ruby Cones? K-O-A-N-S, yes. Don't start with it, though. Get there after a little bit. Ru Ruby Monk? Ruby Monk's where I would start. Okay. I would start with Monk, they've got a good one. <coughs> okay. Just the Chris, Fine, I, it's, the Chris it's, Fine book is also very good for <laughs> beginners. Really good question. Yeah. yeah, that was a great question. Five different answers. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Five different questions. <laughs> or a hundred. Is that it? Yeah, that was a good yeah. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.